uh, workshop contemporary area eight uh, studies. The project of the School of International Regional Studies of the Faculty of Walter Connor and International Affairs, HEC University. Our discussion will be devoted to the coronavirus and its uh, discontents, national and global ramifications and the way forward. So we will talk about it with our key speaker, Dr. Raza Naim, Pakistani social scientist, activist, book critic, and an award-winning translator. Yes and dramatic reader, uh, currently based in Lahore. He has been trained in political economy from the University of Leeds in UK and Middle Eastern history and anthropology from the University of Ekansa uh, at Fayville, USA. He has engaged with the Middle East uh, scene, uh, science the last 16 years and widely traveled in and reported from Egypt, Egypt Yemen and Turkey over the last decade. He is presently working on translation of the selected book of Sip Hassan Mohammed Khalid Akhtar and Abdullah Hussein and contributes regularly the news lines, the, uh, the wire scro uh, scro scroll daily times and the Friday times. Dear Dr. Naim, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to you. The special guests and our colleagues has joined uh, with us today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sergei Luzianin, HSE and Gimoy professor, head of the Institute of Far East, uh, Far Eastern Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences, Joint Department, HSE University. Thank you. Dr. Natalia Milihina, Associated Professor of the Chair of Indo-Iranian and African Languages, Faculty of International Relations in Gimo University. <laughs> and Dr. Natalia Zamaraeva, Senior Researcher of the Center of the Near and Middle East Studies, Institute of Oriental Studies, Russian Academy of Sciences. Dear colleagues, thank you for joining us today. We could, so, we could say that uh, Pakistan is not a well-known country for ordinary people in Russia. Lack of information in the mass media about uh, Pakistan generates remorse about the real situation in the country. As experts, we would like to know the real facts, the opinions, estimations of the contemporary situation. Thanks to Dr. Naim, we will get to know the facts from primary resources. And now, dear Dr. Naim, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vera uh, Vishniakova. I hope I've got your name right. Yes. Uh, I am very grateful uh, to you and your wonderful team for uh, uh, very generously inviting me uh, to deliver this talk. Uh, and also my thanks to your wonderful support person, uh, Murad Sadiq Zadeh. I think that is the correct name, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's a very uh, deep pleasure and honor to address uh, you all in Moscow and uh, I'm actually slightly nervous uh, in delivering this talk because this is the first time uh, I am addressing a mostly Russian audience. You know, I have talked, I have spoken to other audiences around the world, um, you know, in UK, in Turkey, in Europe, but this is the very first time that I am actually addressing uh, 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 an audience in Moscow, which is uh, mostly composed of Russians. And uh, so I'm a bit nervous. So I hope you will forgive me for any uh, nervousness that you may feel uh, in my talk. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think, well, maybe Pakistan is a bit unknown in Russia, but Russia is not unknown in Pakistan, you know. Uh, not too long ago, in the days of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, Russia used to be known throughout the world, you know. And um, we actually had a small left in Pakistan. We had a small communist party which had very good friends uh, in Moscow, you know, and uh, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to address, uh, you know, uh, 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 your audience on this very, very topical issue. Uh, so my talk is basically uh, going to be about, uh, it's divided into three parts. Uh, I will firstly talk about uh, uh, about uh, the global ramifications of the coronavirus and uh, then from the global I will come to the local. I will be talking about Pakistan, which is the country where I live, 
I am addressing you from Lahore, which is one of the largest cities in Pakistan. And then I will go uh, towards a sort of a, uh, you know, future, you know, if at all, is it possible to move forward from this situation? So I hope you will bear with me. Uh, how much time have I got, if I may ask you, please? Uh, about uh, 30, 40 minutes, as you like, as you wish. Great, great. Excellent. Thank you. That's, 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 that's great. So, uh, um, you know, first of all, when, you know, uh, the first thing to be said about the coronavirus is that it is not just a medical emergency. You know, it has, uh, it's a, it has become a huge social and economic problem for the, for the whole world, you know, uh, and, uh, when you look at how various governments around the world are resorting to the virus, it has put a question mark on this whole system which we have today. And when I say the whole system, I mean the dominant system in the world, which is the global capitalist system. You know, a huge question mark has been put uh, on this whole system about its viability, and not for the first time, I must say. Uh, so, the coronavirus has now assumed the status of a global emergency. Uh, and uh, because I have been trained uh, in political economy, uh, you know, my, I will be trying to attempt to address uh, this issue from a political economic perspective. Uh, the first question which needs to be asked is why did this virus become very important in the first place? How did it become so important? Well, it only became important because it arrived in Europe. You know, let's be very clear about it. You know, had it remained confined to China, had it remained confined to Asia, it would not have raised an eyebrow in the rest of the world. Uh, you know, people would have forgotten about it. You know, people now have short memories these days, in the West even more so. Uh, you know, there are thousands of people who die of the malaria epidemic. You know, this is an in the, in the third world, in Africa. Who cares about them? You know, even more casualties from malaria every day in the third world, in parts of Africa, in parts of Asia, still going on. And it kills me, the malaria epidemic kills many more people every day than the coronavirus has actually, uh, you know, killed uh, in three or four months. But who talks about the malaria epidemic? Certainly Europe doesn't talk about it. You know, the West doesn't talk about it. So the coronavirus again, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, and this is not the first time that the world has uh, come to terms with a virus. You know, we keep referring to the Spanish flu more than a hundred years ago. You know, the Spanish flu, uh, which came with the onset of the First World War and killed thousands of people in the first three or four days. Uh, you know, compared to what the coronavirus has done in, in the first three or four months. Uh, so there have been viruses before also, let's, you know, if, if we are good students of history, we, we should know that there have been viruses before, and I am very optimistic that like all viruses, this will be overcome. I'm absolutely sure about it. We will overcome it uh, eventually. I mean, I am not, uh, I don't have a crystal ball in front of me. I can't tell you when we will overcome it. Uh, that is not my job, but we will overcome it. I am very hopeful. So, where did the virus originate? I think uh, Wuhan is the arc of the future. You know, this is the place where the virus started from, and this is the place where the virus is going to end. And in a way, they have actually ended it. You know, if you look at what the Chinese government has done in Wuhan, I mean, it has shocked the whole world. So, this Wuhan is the arc of the future, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, they have started recovering uh, from the virus, uh, you know, in a much better way than has been done anywhere else in the world. So how has the West come to, come to terms with the virus? Let, let, me, uh, let me just talk about the case of the United Kingdom, because I was educated in the United Kingdom 
as you know my master's degree is from leeds which is in uk and then i will come to the united states what has been done and why i am talking about the uk and why i am talking about the usa is because these case studies are vital for us sitting in the third world if we want to have any hope of coming to terms with the virus uh because the response to the virus honestly speaking has been shocking in the west for me it has been shocking how the uk government uh, has uh, come to terms with the virus it has been a chronic shock how the us government has dealt with with the virus so uh there there were there are absolutely no facilities in the united kingdom to deal with a virus of this sort for the last 25 years you know i mean it's it's a surprise that these are supposedly welfare states you know united kingdom but they were absolutely caught by surprise because everything in the united kingdom has been privatized since the last 25 years i mean the state has just withdrawn itself from protecting the lives of its vulnerable people i mean it's a system which is running on money you know if you have money if you can have cooked food in your home excellent you can pay for private hospitals you can go there you can die in a hospital no problem at all but what about the vulnerable people i mean what about other people you know because ultimately you are going to die whether you know if you are in hospital you will die if you are at home you will die so uh, the response of the united kingdom government uh, you know the response of the prime minister of uk boris johnson who himself was a patient until not too long ago you know he uh, you know the world was very concerned about him you know he was uh, in uh, st thomas's hospital in london you know the response was disbelief it can't happen you know that there is nothing the serious about this virus it was it will pass on we don't need to be worried about it now here a big question arises you know why do these viruses originate in the first place you know um, and what type of doctors are needed to treat these viruses i mean let's be very honest uh, in the united kingdom i mean the state did absolutely nothing uh, to uh, to protect its vulnerable people there was a lot of volunteer work excellent volunteer work was done in the uk uh, there are many many good doctors in the united kingdom like in pakistan like in russia i'm sure very 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 good doctors very good doctors who are you know coming to terms with the corona virus but the state has done nothing in the united kingdom the state has done nothing in the united states and this question of the state is vital if we want to understand the global and national ramifications of the corona virus and what to do about it you know it's a big issue in pakistan you know um, you know uh, you know because only a strong state can take care of its citizens you know state institutions if state institutions are strong then you know you can deal with any sort of a virus you know uh, but the problem in pakistan is that even in pakistan we had two or three huge opportunities when you know there were governments in power you know i'm sure you know about zulfikar ali bhutto and his daughter benazir bhutto you know when they came to power they had huge opportunities to do something for the people you know build hospitals you know what we need is uh, maybe a clinic in every village you know four or five state of the art hospitals in every city which the state should provide you know which the state should fund but what is happening in pakistan is that most of the money and this goes for other countries in the third world also most of the money is going into prestige projects you know you build big highways big flyovers you know you know but this money does not go into hospitals money does not go into education money does not go into employment so this is the reason when you have a huge crisis like corona virus the state just doesn't know what to do uh you know private enterprise yes we talk a lot about private enterprise we talk a lot about private hospitals but they can't do anything you know um, the majority of the people you know you know uh, they can't afford private hospitals you know so state intervention is necessary whether it's the corona virus or it's any other sort of a virus and this is the reason why we keep coming back to the united kingdom and the united states because there's a huge problem right now in the united states
United Kingdom. The two most, I mean, the United Kingdom was the most powerful country. Um, they used to say that the sun will never set on the British Empire. And when the sun set on the British Empire, then the United States took over that role. So these are the two leading countries in the world. You know, many people in the third world look to these countries with admiration. What is the situation in the United Kingdom? Let's talk about the National Health Service. I mean, now I have friends who are working in the National Health Service. And over the last 25 years in the United Kingdom, the National Health Service has been downgraded. You know, the number of hospital beds have been reduced uh, and the state in the UK is giving less expenditure to, you know, to medicine. Uh, and this project, let's be fair to Boris Johnson, this project, project did not be begin under Boris Johnson, it began under the Labour Prime Minister Tony Blair. He was the one who started this process. And, uh, you know, recently there was a, a debate about uh, making new buildings of the National Health Service. You know, and the response of the state was, okay, these buildings of the National Health Service will be funded by private finance initiatives, PFIs. How can you finance a National Health Service by private funding? You know, people pleaded with the Prime Minister, for God's sake, don't do this. Don't fund the state's National Health Service using PFIs, you know, because we will spend all our lives paying interest to hospitals. You know, we will die repaying the interest, but nothing, no, you know, no one heard their plea. And now this whole thing has blown in their face when you look at how the British state has responded to the coronavirus. So the British state was absolutely taken by surprise when the coronavirus came. They did not even have self-protection kits, you know, PPEs. You know, could you believe they did not have self-protection kits? So they had to be brought from China. Masks had to be ordered from China. Uh, and the British pleaded with the Cubans, you know, for God's sake, give us some equipment. And Cuba is a very interesting example. You know, Cuba is a very small country of five or six million people. It is a country which has been under repeated sanctions since 1959, you know, when the revolution took place in Cuba. But its model of health is copied around the world. They send doctors free of cost around the world, you know, so much so that Italy, you know, Italy was the worst European country affected by, by, the, by the coronavirus. You know, when the European Union refused to help Italy, what did they do? They asked Cuba, and this tiny island of five to six million people, which is routinely demonized in the American media for being a dictatorship, for being this, for being that, this country sent a whole brigade of doctors to Italy, and though that brigade of doctors had quite an impact in Italy, so much so that the Italian prime minister is now publicly advocating that if any country in the world wants to uh, do something about coronavirus, they should import a brigade from Cuba. It's a huge thing, you know? And my country, Pakistan, has a direct example of, of this because in 2005, you know, uh, there was a massive earthquake in Pakistan. Maybe you heard about it. It, it killed a lot of people. You know, and Pakistan's health infrastructure is very fragile, you know. Uh, it spends less than 5% of its budget on health services. So where were the doctors going to come from? You know, there were American helicopters in Afghanistan. No, the doctors were not sent by the Americans. The doctors were sent by a small country called Cuba, with which we did not have diplomatic relations. So the doctors were sent by Cuba, and you know uh, they did an excellent job. And it was after that that you know Pakistan established diplomatic relations with Cuba. And by the way, this international diplomacy is not a recent example. Cuba has been sending doctors as part of its international diplomacy since 1959. You know, it's not a recent development. So what the United Kingdom should have done was to have nationalized the private hospitals. They should have nationalized the private hospitals. Lot of sensible people, lot of sensible intellectuals pleaded with the UK government to nationalize the private hospitals. Okay, fine, you want to compensate them, give them a bit of compensation, but for God's sake, privatize the hospitals. But this, the hospitals were not privatized. In fact, the British state is paying thousands of pounds every day to private hospitals. For what? 
you know it's just like you're paying thousands of pounds to a five star hotel you know it's like paying to a private hospital you know so uh, and the response in uk was total denial you know there's no need to test the patients the virus is going to go away we don't need equipment we don't need tests and what country were they comparing them with they were comparing themselves with germany i mean uh, germany has just successfully lifted the lockdown why was germany so successful not because the germans are very healthy people you know because the, the casual is in germany have been less because the number of nurses in germany is very very high the number of trained nurses you know the german government sends the nurses to each and every home in germany like it or not they said we have to test you know and so that we know if the patient has a strong virus or the, it has a mild virus if the german patient had a strong virus he was immediately sent to the hospital if he had a mild virus you know uh, he was asked to stay at home so this is how the germans you know reacted to the corona virus and this is the reason why they have been able to lift it i think they have become the first country in europe to totally lift the lockdown and this is not what was done done in italy you know france is doing it now you know they didn't listen to the germans before they're doing it now and in the united kingdom it's a total disaster still they are not listening uh, to uh, to their neighbors the germans what about the united states you know many people in the third world many rulers of countries look to the united states with a lot of admiration it is hell right now i'm not joking it is hell it is like hell in the united states right now many of my friends in new york it's they say it's just like living in hell you know what the conditions which they are facing because yeah there was some disruption okay so in the united states again what has been happening in the united states is that medicine has been totally privatized i mean if you don't have medical insurance you are free to die at home it's very simple as that you know you can die at home and of course there are poor people living in the united states you know many of us uh, you know uh, criticize the americans but we forget that the american state is different from the american people there are many poor people living in the united states i mean this notion of a third world in the united states was it's not a new notion i mean what about the black people what about the hispanic population what about immigrants for them this is a normal life they can't they can't afford medical insurance it is very expensive so they die but when a crisis and a virus like corona virus comes it's a disaster to have a president like donald trump there it's a total disaster you know you have a corona virus and you have a president who has contempt for the virus i mean i don't know what he's thinking about the virus you know maybe it's there in his mind he's making up things about it i mean uh, many of our friends say the americans don't deserve a president like they deserve a president like trump but i am sorry i don't agree with that you know the americans also have normal people as i said you know there are a lot of poor americans what did they do to deserve a president like donald trump so donald trump like boris johnson like so many populist governments everywhere around the world you know haim bolsonaro in brazil narendra modi uh, in in india even in pakistan you know they took the virus very 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 lightly and the effects are there for everyone to see i mean new york city uh, you know uh, is a disaster zone right now uh, so uh, and of course you know it is in these times that you miss someone like bernie sanders you know because bernie sanders was a candidate who was talking about the problems of medicine in the united states he was talking about the single payer system what is the single payer system you know the single payer system uh, has the power if the single payer system is introduced in the united states it can destroy the power of the insurance companies you know the american health bill was written by insurance companies it was not written by uh, professional doctors and thanks to the american health bill most of the money is going to the insurance companies 
you know a lot of the money by the us state is going to the insurance companies yes there is a lot of health spending in the united states the uh, the health spending uh, of the american government uh, is greater than the health spending of most european governments but the money is not going into hospitals you know it is going to the insurance companies so uh, you know this is the reason uh, that uh, you know it is uh, you know it is has been a total uh, you know disaster in the uh, in the in the united states uh, and uh, you know uh, let me come back to uh, china you know in many uh, in you know in many uh, uh, in many uh, many intellectuals uh, are saying uh, now you know oh you know uh, we have started look at china you know uh, why is the world talking about china you know you know okay fine uh, they uh, the arc of the future is in china you know fine uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, what happened in wuhan uh, but uh, you know they are basically an authoritarian country you know this was only possible because china is an authoritarian country but i say this is a nonsense claim you know because people in the united states educated people intellectuals like shadi hamid you know who are writing in the atlantic who are writing in the new york times even they have been swayed by this stupid argument that because china is an authoritarian state therefore they are able to deal with the corona virus in a better way i mean this is a nonsense claim yes of course china is an authoritarian country i mean i have friends in china we criticize china but you know in the matter of corona virus it is the state institutions which matter it is the strong chinese state which has succeeded in dealing with corona virus you know in just two weeks they managed to raise a big hospital there can't we do it can't we raise a hospital in pakistan can't russian can the russian government raise a hospital can't the american i mean certainly the americans and the british have more resources than china but the fact is they are afraid of china it is because china the chinese were able to raise a hospital in two weeks but they were not able to do it okay um, so you need a strong state one of the big lessons from the corona virus epidemic is that you need a strong state in a country uh, which says that yes we have a strong state and we are going to do it we are going to protect our citizens from this crisis by building institutions by building hospitals by you know uh, giving a rapid response which, which the chinese did so what the chinese have done in wuhan is a miracle i mean it's amazing and you know uh, they also sent advices to pakistan uh, you know to advise us about about uh, how to deal with the virus and i will come back to it in a moment what what advice they gave and how our government dealt with that uh, so yes the chinese state is an authoritarian state i mean uh, but if they yes uh, the virus could have been detected uh, early uh, many of the casualties in china could have been avoided had they been more flexible had there been a bit of democratic accountability had people not feared that if they raised the alarm they would be caught and put in jail uh, yes that could have been overcome uh, but the west is worried about china because basically they can't do what china did even if they have the resources to do it they don't have the will to do it you know uh, so if you look at some of the success stories uh, you know around the world uh, you know many of them are countries where the state is very very strong we've talked about china look at vietnam vietnam is a big success story it is also ruled by the communist party you know there are 326 cases of corona virus and <laughs> zero casualties why in a country like vietnam you know lot about new zealand they have a very brave uh, uh, woman prime minister called jessica ardern i mean new zealand is not a socialist country by any stretch of the imagination you know the indian state of kerala yes you know they have been uh, you know uh, under the communist party for uh, more than 50 years you know here there was testing regular testing and also a public health information system which involves the people to you know on a day to day basis to inform them about what efforts were being done there were literacy campaigns you know going from village to village 
from city to city, a bit like the barefoot literacy campaigns which you had under Mao, under Castro in 1959, you know, but those public literacy campaigns are missing from countries uh, like Pakistan, countries like maybe Russia, countries like America, uh, countries like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the United Kingdom, which have more resources, you know. So the question is to be asked, wh what is preventing these European countries from doing what was done in Vietnam, what was done in China, what was done in New Zealand, what was done in Kerala? Uh, so let me uh, uh, come to uh, come to Pakistan now, um, and of course Pakistan. Unfortunately, I, I wish I had better news to report. Um, uh, you know, Pakistan, as we speak right now, I'm sitting in Lahore, which is in Punjab, which is the largest province of Pakistan. Uh, it, uh, Lahore is one of the largest cities in Pakistan. Pakistan has more than sixty-two thousand confirmed cases of coronavirus. More than 62,000 confirmed cases as I speak and more than 1,000 casualties, more than 1,000 people dead and uh, the lockdown was lifted very stupidly in last week and since the lockdown was lifted for Eid, deaths have gone up fivefold. Deaths have gone up five times with 48% of the deaths happening in the last 15 days. So Pakistan is a country, if you want to ask how not to respond to the coronavirus, Pakistan is a wonderful case study for that. How not to respond to the coronavirus? It has been an absolute disaster because the Supreme Court in this country just ruled that the COVID-19 is not a pandemic and because Eid is approaching, you know, Eid is the festival of the Muslims, the Supreme Court, this is the largest court, highest court of the land, ordering the reopening of shopping malls, ordering congregational prayer, prayer, the Juma prayer, you know, where you have thousands of people who are praying in mosques without any masks, without any protection, and the situation uh, is now on a dagger's edge. I'm sorry to say, many hospitals in Pakistan are now at full capacity. They have turned away many patients saying we cannot take in more 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 patients uh, you know chinese experts came to pakistan in april uh, you know after they had overcome the situation in wuhan they brought equipment with them much needed equipment but the equipment was basically meant for which kind of people equipment was meant for the doctors who were on the front lines fighting uh, for the right of people like me, uh, me to 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 be uh, to uh, to be safe, the, and the equipment was meant for the daily waging people who go out there every day to earn their daily bread. But was the equipment given to those people? No, the equipment was given to the elite. You know, the sons and daughters of the elite who rule Pakistan. People who don't need it, you know, because they can just sit in their homes and they can sit in their quarantine. Their wages are being paid to them. They are working on their laptops. So this was not done. You know, the Chinese ordered a strict lockdown to the Pakistan. They advised a strict lockdown to the Pakistani government. And the Pakistani government, uh, you know, they went from one position to another. First, they said, we are going to have a smart lockdown. Then from a smart lockdown, they went to herd immunity. I mean, these are all buzzwords imported from the West. I mean, they have little currency in third world countries. And from herd immunity, now they are going uh, towards, uh, you know, uh, total end of lockdown. And this is, a, and you know, what is affecting the Pakistani government's uh, ability to fight coronavirus is the fact that at the height of the coronavirus, when the need was to give protection to the workers, give protection to the health workers, give a sort of state, uh, you know, welfare system for the poor and deprived, they signed an agreement of the IMF. You know, Pakistan signed an agreement with the International Monetary Fund. And the International Monetary Fund agreement forces the state of Pakistan to cut down on social spending to cut down on health spending. This was at the height of the coronavirus in May. So there was a backlash from the health workers when the government of Pakistan in April 
just last month tried to push through the privatization of health services, the doctor community came out onto the streets. They said, you know, what kind of a state are you? You know, we need to be protected at a time when we need to have a unified strategy to fight the coronavirus. How dare you push through an IMF agreement, which is basically cutting down, uh, you know, cutting down uh, the health services and making us more vulnerable. And then what happened, you know, in Gilgit, Baltistan, which is one of the marginalized uh, areas of Pakistan, a 26-year-old doctor, you know, he died, uh, you know, while he was treating the coronavirus patients. And, uh, you know, he died, uh, he had contracted coronavirus because of lack of equipment, lack of PPE, personal protective equipment. And one month later, a nurse in Kasur, which is in Punjab, which is, you know, Lahore, where I live is in, in Punjab, a nurse died. And it was demanded from the government to test that nurse whether she had coronavirus or not. And the government refused to test her. Could you believe it? And there was a backlash. You know, there is this huge uh, group of doctors, uh, which is called the Grand Health Alliance. You know, they came out and they made, they carried a strike of 10 days. So finally, the government backed down. They said, okay, we are going to do the testing to the nurse. And the problem does not end here. Our prime minister, like populist prime ministers everywhere, I think one of the big viruses of a bigger virus than coronavirus is the populist virus, you know, which you find everywhere now in the world. Populism, you know, if we if we uh, if we succeed in uh, getting rid of the coronavirus, I think populism will all, also die its natural death because this populism is really making a mess of the coronavirus fight, whether it's in Brazil with Bolsonaro, whether it is uh, in, in the United States with Trump, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, in the Philippines with Duterte, in India with Modi, in Pakistan, you know. Uh, so at the height of the coronavirus, Imran Khan, our prime minister, he is giving the construction industry a rescue package of $100 billion to revive the construction industry. I mean, Pakistan is a country which is dependent on exports, you know? What kind of construction are you going to have when there are going to be no people to build the houses, you know, because people are vulnerable? You know, what is needed is for uh, them to be, you know, to restructure, this, restructure the shape of the economy, to make it responsive to the needs of the people, to stop these prestige projects, to devote, uh, the, but you know, more, you know, let me tell you, 50% uh, of the national, I mean, budget is going to be presented in June. Uh, it is obviously going to be an emergency budget. You know, more than 50% of the GDP is going to pay, uh, to pay the debts. And the other 50% is going for military spending. I mean, the IMF World Bank never says cut down on military spending. It is for our government to recognize, you know, that at the height of the virus, you know, it is the most vulnerable sections of the population which need to be protected. And this means that you want to increase the amount of, uh, you know, government expenditure to more than 5%, 10, 15, 20%. You know, if you want to A, protect the vulnerable sections of the population, uh, who are the workers, who are the daily wages, who cannot, like the elite, sit at home, work on their laptops, and pretend that everything is okay. And B, you need uh, a common minimum income, you know, a guaranteed minimum income for people who are the most vulnerable. Uh, then obviously, uh, I mean, the lockdown has not been respected. And it is because the writ of the state is very weak. I mean, uh, you know, uh, in a country like Turkey, let me tell you, you know, we follow Turkey a lot in Pakistan, you know, in a country like Turkey, which is also a developing country, you know, Turkey, uh, you know, ordered a four day curfew before Eid, which started on the weekend. So Monday to Friday, every week, they have a total curfew, no one, below 20 years of age and no one above 65 years of age is allowed to go out into the city. If they are allowed, you will have a big fine imposed on you. You know, even if children are playing in the courtyard outside the home and the police come, they will ask you to go inside. Even children cannot play 
outside the courtyard of their home. Even that is uh, the seriousness of how the lockdown is affected. You know, the Turkish government, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the Turkish government. It is a populist government. But what I'm telling you is, for countries like Pakistan, which want to learn from the example, I mean, and Turkey has imposed a total curfew, 80% curfew in most of their big cities you know and uh, you know let me tell you there is a sense of accountability why because before Eid, the interior minister of turkey said we are going to impose uh, a four-day curfew so many people became panicked you know they went out they said oh my god there's going to be a curfew we need to stock up on the things you need to buy and for three or four hours there was complete panic no one died but the next day, the interior minister of Turkey resigned because he said he had a sense of responsibility. He said that no one is respecting the writ of the state. I have ordered a four-day curfew. People are on the streets. They are buying. I am sorry. I, I failed. I resigned. So this is basically the sense of accountability of public servants at the height of coronavirus in a country like Turkey, which is a middle-income country, by the way. You know, I think it's one of the neighbors of Russia also. Uh, so I mean, so lastly, I'm going to say what is basically needed. What is basically needed right now in countries like Pakistan? Number one, you need to have a. You need to have consistency you know if you need to have a lockdown then you have to have a lockdown you cannot have a smart lockdown and then you go for herd immunity and then two weeks later your supreme court orders the shopping malls to open because people have to go out shopping i mean this is a lack of inconsistency this is a criminal lack of negligence so what is going to be done the writ of the state you need again a and again, the question of the state is very important. The state needs to be strong. You know, the state needs to enforce its wit. And we have seen many examples of states in my talk. I gave the example of China. Okay, if China is too communist for you, if it's too authoritarian for you, look at Turkey. You know, they are a member of NATO. Are they acceptable to you? Look at look at the how the state has enforced the writ during coronavirus. Okay, so the state needs to be strong. Uh, secondly, uh, you need to have a welfare program for you know, the most vulnerable people in the population. You know, uh, you know, and other countries have done it. Other countries which are authoritarian states, which are not democratic states, have done it. Why can't Pakistan do it? You know, you need to have a minimum basic income, uh, which so the the at least so the and you know just today the Spanish government, the Spain, you know, one was one of the worst affected countries. You know, their government has announced a tax on the elite. They said we will we will come out of the coronavirus by taxing our elite because it is the elite who have been subsidized for too long. I mean, the elite can sit in their homes and work on their laptops, but it is the poor people who are paying the price of the lockdown. Uh, and last and, and thirdly, public literacy campaign is very, very important. I mean, this is very, very important. It, I mean, yes, the state needs to take measures, but you need to have public literacy campaign. Why should a lockdown be imposed? What is the impact of the, uh, you know, what is the impact of how long are we in it for? You know, I mean, Vietnam, I talked about Vietnam. Why is Vietnam a success story? Not because they're ruled by the Communist Party of Vietnam, but because, uh, yes, they're ruled by the Communist Party, but also because, you know, there is zero casualty there because they went out, they, they have a very strong public uh, literacy campaign, you know, so you need the art of communication also. Your ruling elite need the art of communication with the masses. Most of the time, the governments are just talking to one another, to the elite, the elite are talking to the elite. If you want the people to respect the lockdown, to respect the coronavirus, you need to have a public literacy campaign, mass public literacy about you know, why the coronavirus needs to be opposed, what can be done about it, how will people be affected, what are the short-term uh, solutions, what are the long-term solutions, and lastly, you need to test 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 in pakistan testing is a big issue you know the big questions in pakistan are a uh, who can ask for a coronavirus test and b 
if if the people ask for coronavirus test are they also qualified to go through a coronavirus test you know these are two different questions you know so most of the countries where you have seen success with coronavirus mm-hmm. and minimization of casualties are the countries i talked about germany you know are the countries where the testing regime has been enhanced you know drastically you know uh, so this is basically uh, the need of the hour uh, you know i am uh, you, uh, you, uh, you know you know i am a translator and i work on uh, i work on literature also so i don't want to end on a very pessimistic note so if you like uh, i would like to recite this poem to you which was written by one of our uh, uh, great greatest poets uh, this words for kishor naid it is about the corona virus you know and how the most vulnerable people are being are affected by the corona virus i would just like to recite this poem for you because poets are people who are always hopeful you know governments uh, may not be hopeful governments can be bought governments can become corrupt but poets are the hope of the people they are the voice of their people even when they go into exile you know good poetry offers hope to people in the darkest of times and we are living in a dead dark time so this is the poem that this is a poet uh, called kishwar nahid she is going to be 80 in june and she has just written a wonderful poem called who will be our savior and this poem i have translated in uh, english and i will just recite it for you to give you some hope uh, okay thank you thank you i will just recite this poem for you Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much Dr. Naim. It was very fresh, informative, yes, uh informative point of view from Pakistan about not not only about the Pakistan uh not only about the Pakistan but uh the situation or all, all, all over the world. Uh it was really interesting and we start our second part of our seminar, the discussion. Uh I give the floor our experts. If uh, they have uh, some comments, uh, you are welcome. Natalia Alexeyevna, Nat- Natalia Valerievna. Uh, can I recite the poem before you can begin the second session? If I am not Maybe. Mis- yes, please. Oh, okay, no. yes, please. Sorry, because I want to end on an optimistic note. Uh, <laughs> poem called, uh, Who Will Be Their Savior? Uh, I was not born in paradise. that i am the progeny of the earth is surely no surprise children like me of all the villages and country wise shuffle and thrive in the earth barefoot it is true to surmise when the sixth or seventh child is born of a mother's pass on a new mother comes on neither my father sitting in the village congregation nor my mother her elbows on the wall with the neighbor engaged in conversation bother to remember the advertisements about corona running on the television we are indeed waiting that when the seller of sweet and sour candies will be arriving and we savor now gram then tamarind and sometimes candy each costing a 10 penny and playing just like that we grow old had the schools been open the teacher might have told what do we know about corona for the schools are closed coming towards the city then on every square with their hoes and spades and headlong stare the workers of every age broke with broken sandals feet almost bare that someone hire them for a daily wage or on an especially kind day as wage by telling them while going away that because of corona's mounting pillage we will come another time another age they all ask each other what has our wage to do with corona what a bother upon reaching home the mother presents him with the stale bread together with pickle to complete the daily spread she asks what of the daily wage corona he grumbles with rage the four children holding the stale bread fall as leap immediately upon hitting the bare bread the father lighting a cigarette taking a puff says hi when will this corona be off from the nomadic gypsy huts the smoke spews giving off some news that today there will be fresh bread to eat 
the mosquitoes over the hut dancing as if to beat and listening to the sounds of crickets below in the summer heat the children after eating go into a sleepy retreat there is a single tv in this whole settlement which all the women see for entertainment but man or woman no one indeed hears of corona's destructive impairment and this is the last uh, stanza from iran to milan there is no dearth from iran to milan there is no dearth of people dying daily people being buried under the earth in our raw settlement even the news of the dead does not arrive but one news indeed does thrive that of a scene where only pigeons circling around the great mosque of makkah and the revered kaaba can be seen so on this poetic uh, note i would like to thank you very much for your attention thank you very much it was excellent yes <laughs> uh, thank you. yeah and now oh, we start the second part yes. Uh, yes if you have any question or comments you are welcome Natalia Alexin yeah. okay yes uh, just we start from our experts yes and then i give the floor to our guests we have some uh, questions uh, in the chat i read yeah. it and then give the floor of uh, our guest from canada from toronto sure here uh, natalia alexia natalia valerievna sergey gennadievich if you have some comments you are welcome uh, yeah thank you very much uh, mr naim for your brilliant presentation it's it's a very uh, very very informative and your speech is brilliant thank you very much Yes, and uh, but at the same time, I have uh, many questions, of course. But I ask you only two because uh, you you give us uh, a lot of information. Yeah, and the first question, as, uh, as far as I know, the danger, uh, the most dangerous situation, I mean, uh, concerning the coronavirus, is in Sint Prov province. Uh, can you explain to me why? Uh, why it happened uh, um, in in Sin province? And the second question uh, concerning the um, uh, the uh, input of federal army in the fight with this virus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you repeat your second question, please? I did not hear it clearly. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. And uh, um, concerning the input of federal army in the fight of this coronavirus i mean all over uh, all over the territory of pakistan thank you thank you very much uh, yes thank you very much um, uh, coming to your first question i am afraid i don't agree with uh, your uh, assessment of the coronavirus situation in sindh i think uh, uh, coronavirus in sindh has been basically the exception to the rule i mean while uh, you know um, uh, you know um, uh, casualties have been going on in the rest of the of pakistan the sindh government was actually the first one which disregarded the federal government's uh, totally stupid stance about not having a lockdown they said we will have a lockdown and they had a very successful lockdown and uh, you know there the actually it has been one of the few success stories yeah, uh, of tackling coronavirus in pakistan you know yes, yes, because uh, they yeah, but, uh, online uh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. i think there is some disruption mm -hmm. Okay, so the Sindh government passed uh, immediately a Corona Emergency Relief Ordinance, you know, uh, and this meant basically, uh, I mean, uh, that uh, it, it took the lead actually in, in, in the fight against coronavirus because unlike the response of the federal government, uh, you know, the chief minister of Sindh, the highest office in Sindh, they had a very clear situation about what to do. So in, I think uh, the casualties in Sindh have been on the lower side in the rest of them. Compared to the rest of Pakistan, and uh, in fact, none of the chief ministers of the province regarded what the prime minister was saying. Our prime minister, like other populist leaders, totally disregarded 
uh, you know what the Chinese told him. They said we are not going to have a lockdown. First, the Sindh minister said no, we are going to have a lockdown. Then the Punjab uh, chief minister, who belongs to Imran Khan's party, he even said that we are going to have a lockdown. Even in Balochistan, which is the poorest province, so everywhere in most of the provinces in Pakistan, they disagreed with what our respected prime minister was saying about having no lockdown. So Singh actually is the leader in Pakistan in terms of less number of casualties, you know, and still they are being criticized. And unfortunately, it has become a political battle. It has become a politicized battle. Obviously, uh, it's such a devastating uh, virus. It should not be politicized. But of course, Pakistan is not an exception to this. There are other parts of the world where the virus has been politicized also. Uh, coming back to your second uh, question, you were asking me about the response of the federal army. Yeah, yeah, yes. To what? Sorry, response to what? Response for what? For, for what? Uh, uh, the input of the uh, federal army in the fight or with this uh, against this virus. What did federal army do in the fight against this virus? Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, Pakistani army right now, of course, uh, is more uh, engaged on the border. You know, just today they, uh, you know, they destroyed an Indian spy helicopter in the state of Azad, Jammu and Kashmir. So I don't think, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, the only, uh, you know, uh, the only uh, thing which I can report. Um, is that, uh, you know, the only notable thing which the Pakistani army has done in terms of coronavirus is that they are using terrorist tracking technology to hunt the coronavirus, you know. Uh, you know, their in Pakistan's intelligence services are developing, uh, they have deployed secretive surveillance technology which normally is used to locate militants, you know, the terrorists. In instead, now the army is using this surveillance equipment to track coronavirus patients and the people who are coming in touch with these coronavirus patients. And this technology uh, has been cited publicly uh, by the Prime Minister. You know, we unfortunately uh, don't know a lot about uh, this technology because, of course, it's a secretive technology, like everything secretive about the army. But what I can tell you is that the intelligence services of Pakistan are using geofencing and phone monitoring systems, uh, which are basically employed to hunt high-value targets like foreign terrorists, homegrown terrorists. So this is the sort of technology uh, which is uh, basically, it's a very discrete tracking system, which alerts the authorities when some is leaving a specific geographical area, you know, and basically because of this geofencing, it has helped officials monitor neighborhoods, you know. Uh, also, another use being made of this equipment is that whenever, um, you know, um, COVID, uh, you know, COVID patients are approached by their contacts, and they are talking about showing symptoms. So that technology captures that immediately. You know, when you know when the relatives of COVID patients are even talking among themselves, the possibility that the that the relative may have a symptom, you know. So it helps to track the mobile phones of the corona patients as well as anyone which gets in touch with them after they disappear or even before uh, you know they disappear. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. And now we have uh, we have one question from Canada, from yes. uh, Sitara Shaikh. Could you uh, could you say uh, your uh, occupation? And uh, okay, Intra in yes. introduce yourself, please, for us. Because okay, sure. My name is Sitara, and I'm um, I'm in Toronto, Canada, and I have been working in the field of child protection for the past 20 years, and I'm working as a consultant now, and I did some work, consultancy work in Pakistan as well, because I'm originally from Pakistan. So I want to thank Mr. Reza Naim for this informative presentation. It has been very helpful, especially because you looked at it from a very global perspective. So I have a couple of questions. My first question mm -hmm. is, uh, in the beginning, you said you're very optimistic. You said you're optimistic. 
yeah. uh, moving forward that we are going to get rid of this pandemic, which is great. Yes. It's good to be positive. My question to you is, do you think that the developing and the emerging countries will be able to access, buy, and administer the uh, vaccine, and especially with reference to Pakistan? Because it's going to be a huge thing for the developing countries how we are going to do it going past COVID-19. Okay, thank you. Is that one question or two questions? I thought you said two questions. I'll ask you the second question later on, please. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, uh, Sitara. Um, um, Sitara is a, a dear friend from Toronto and I'm grateful to her for joining us. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, you I, I mean, uh, I have personally benefited from your question. Well, uh, look, uh, much before the question of vaccine, I think the first question is, and I think I hinted at it uh, uh, even in my, um, in my talk, uh, you know, um, most of the countries which have, uh, you know, fought the coronavirus, uh, more than the vaccine, they had very strong state systems, you know. Um, I think the vaccine in itself is not, even if the vaccine is developed, even the most optimistic estimate is that, uh, I mean, the ram desivir is not actually a vaccine. You know, it is basically, it uh, lessens the effects and increases the immunity. It is not the vaccine and there are Pakistani companies and in India and Pakistan Feroz Sons Laboratories have been contracted to produce uh, Ramdesivir on a low basis. But the problem is who is going to get this? Will it be the poor and the most vulnerable people? I mean there are, and even in the third world, even in the rich world, there is a class element to it as well. You know, there are elite people and there are the poor people, you know. I think people like you and me don't need the vaccine because as I mentioned before, we are at home, we are practicing social distancing, even if we are not, we are safe. But even if the vaccine is developed, who is going to use it? I mean, so far, the evidence in Pakistan has not been very, uh, very, very optimistic. I think I mentioned the masks and the PPE, which the Chinese had specifically donated to be used among the frontline health workers who were fighting the coronavirus. It was meant to be distributed among the most vulnerable population, but was it distributed to them? No. It was distributed among the very people who actually don't need it, you know. So I am uh, optimistic about the vaccine, but I'm very skeptical about the distribution. You know, you know, having a vaccine is one thing, but whether it will be distributed to the rightful people, the most vulnerable people, I think even before the vaccine, why should we even rely on the vaccine? You know, we shouldn't wait for the vaccine. I think there have already been success stories. I mean, Asia, look at Asia, you know. Uh, I mean, I didn't mention Iran. Iran had one of, it has one of the best public health systems in the world. Even that has been laid waste by the coronavirus because of the sanctions, because of the sanctions of the United States. You know, on the other hand, you have a country like Vietnam, which is a smaller country than Pakistan. You know, it has a much larger population density than Pakistan. Uh, it is on the border with China. You know, it is ruled by a communist party. So it is a one party state, not a lot of democracy, but they have been able to have zero casualties. You know, is it because of a vaccine which has not been developed? No, it is because of other things which we can do you know, we don't have to wait for the vaccine. Why? I mean, it is, I mean, that is an argument. You know, countries, uh, you know, uh, you know, it may be years before the vaccine may be developed. What are we going to do then? Are we going to wait for more people to be killed? No, I think what we need to do is to learn from these other countries. I think I outlined three or four things which we need to do. First of all, we need to be consistent. Test. You know, I mean, I will throw a question back, you know, there, has, there is no literacy campaign in Pakistan regarding the coronavirus. I mean, there is no consensus about what needs to be done by the state and society. Most of the efforts to feed the poor people have been done by civil society. The government, unfortunately, is, is more busy in politicking, in politicizing, 
in uh, you know unleashing the wrath of the state i think i mentioned what they did to the doctors i did not mention that in quetta in april there was a protest from the doctors they said we don't have equipment for god sake give us equipment so that we can treat and what was the response of the state they brought the army they uh, you know they brought the army they hit them put the doctors in jail i mean this response has been totally unprecedented in any other country you know so i mean there are other problems in countries like pakistan i mean so i'm sorry you know i am optimistic that a vaccine will be developed but in countries like pakistan i don't think the problem is lack of a vaccine the problem is something more different the problem is that the the state needs to be strong it needs to be have a consistent narrative on um, on corona virus it needs to have a public literacy campaign there needs to be a basic minimum income and there you need to have a strong testing regime i think you know again to reiterate i'm sorry to disappoint you there i mean i don't think vaccine is the vaccination is the is the most important problem here in pakistan as far as the corona virus is concerned thank you okay thank you very much uh, mr naim for your uh, very comprehensive uh, response my second question is um, again related to what's going to happen post covid 19 Yes. Um there's an organization called uh, Child War Canada and they work globally with the children and try to save them and do uh, the welfare work. They are projecting that a big number of the children are going to die because of poverty, uh, lack of resources, n- uh, malnourishment. So what's being done to protect this vulnerable sector of the population? in pakistan and if you can talk about around the world to protect these children in the long run in the future thank you well uh, i'm sorry again i have to be i mean i think first of all i said uh, in the beginning of my talk i wish i had a crystal ball where i could predict the future of humanity after the corona virus but i don't have a crystal ball i'm a social scientist so i wish i could give you a more optimistic response i mean this is why we have poetry right we have good poetry which is more optimistic but uh, not a lot is being done to protect uh, the most vulnerable sections of society and the kids that includes the children you know uh, you know uh, uh, you know because uh, i think i told you the lockdown was not enforced and the most vulnerable people uh, anywhere from a lockdown are people uh, below the uh, age of 20 and above the age of 65 and uh, the pakistani government had a totally stupid response to the lockdown they looked at other european countries they said well they have ended the lockdown so we should also end the lockdown i mean totally forgetting that the countries where where the lockdown has ended are those countries where there was a rigorous sort of a testing prior to to ending the lockdown so you know so unfortunately uh, the response the balance sheet for the children are also uh, is also very negative because this is a country uh, where uh, we have a very high population ratio every family i mean a standard family has you know two or three children and it's even worse in the rural areas children have never been treated as a priority by a state i mean when this government came to power they said yes we want to establish a welfare state we want to establish a welfare state like medina you know the old state of the prophet muhammad which was a welfare state but uh, i mean that was mere lip service i mean i mean if a welfare state had been imposed in pakistan then the children and the workers and the women would have been at the front of being protected whether the virus came or the virus did not come unfortunately that has not happened so uh, i am very sorry to say uh, you know during the this uh, temporary end of lockdown you know if you looked at the videos of the bazaars everywhere the children were with their mothers they were streaming in the bazaars shopping in the bazaars no masks no protection no social distancing protocol so unfortunately in this type of a type of an environment the children are 
unfortunately susceptible to a um, lot of vulnerability and i fear what is going to happen to the children as i mentioned uh, 62 more than 62000 people already confirmed in pakistan and most of them include children and women who are anywhere and anywhere the most vulnerable in the population i think i mentioned turkey as an example where they had enforced strict regulation saying that anyone below the age of 20 and anyone above the age of 65 found to be loitering outside the home will be immediately struck with a heavy fine in terms of pakistani rupees that comes to thousands of rupees fine even when uh, children I, i know personally from a friend of mine who is in turkey right now a policeman was wandering on the streets and forcing the lockdown he saw children playing in the courtyard he said go in the inside your home you are not children are not allowed to play even in the courtyard of their homes during the curfew so this is what countries like turkey are doing you know uh, i mean um, and um, you know so and in germany it is also the same i mean i think why germany i mean some of us had reservations when germany lifted the lockdown but if we study the german example uh, and germany is closer to russia than it is to pakistan geographically i think they were only able to lift the lockdown because they were able to protect their vulnerable people through rigorous testing so rhetoric is not important you have to match the rhetoric if you say you are going to have a welfare state then you do it you know you know increase so you know if you want to enforce a lockdown then enforce a lockdown if you want to you know uh, you know and i think one of the four things which must be done immediately to protect the children is to enforce and enhance the regime of testing you know we have been found wanting in terms of testing in pakistan okay thank you very much Thank, Thank you. you for a question for, for for a question from Canada. It was very uh, interesting and experience for us. And now I want to give the floor to Natalia Milikova to Dr. Natalia Milikova. If you have some comments or question, you are welcome. And then uh, and then I will give the floor to Sergey to Professor Sergey Luzyanin. Yes, for some some comments. Okay. Hey. Yes. Thank Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Naim, for your very frank analysis, uh, a very comprehensive analysis. I, I, I have two questions. Uh, nice. You know, uh, uh, first question uh, is that, uh, what, is, what do you think, how do you think it, ha- it, could, it could happen to that uh, uh, the Supreme Court of Pakistan uh, made such a decision? uh what what could be the reason because i was very much surprised when i read in newspapers about it and now you proved because i thought maybe i did not understand so clearly what i <laughs> what i read resource, yes <laughs> yes what what how do you think what were the reasons uh, uh and a second question um is that uh, now there are a lot of discussions uh, in most uh, of the countries uh about um, uh what will be after this uh, uh pandemia and not uh, only uh, discussions not only about vaccine uh, but about uh, economic uh, crisis and yeah. economic problems raised uh, by this uh, um, covid-19 uh i also read that um c- concerning some uh big projects uh, which are uh, taken under the uh China and Pakistan economic corridor could be uh, to this or, or that uh, affected by this uh, economic crisis but uh, um, my question is more uh, more general concerning Pakistan uh, uh, Pakistan economy and the uh, possible uh, possible effects uh, of uh, this uh, pandemic thank you thank you very much Thank you very much uh, they are uh, very important and relevant questions uh, the first question is relatively easier to answer uh, about uh, why the chief justice would uh, uh, order something like that i think pakistan if you understand anything about pakistan it should be that here uh, the judiciary has recently been politicized you know uh, you know i think you know that pakistan not too long ago was ruled by a military dictator called general musharraf and uh, when he tried to sack the chief justice 
because he did not uh, accept uh, the dictatorship there was a huge movement to restore the judiciary and the lawyers and the judges played a huge part uh, in that movement and that after many many years it was the first time in pakistan when the lawyers became a force now that can have good things that can have bad things also i mean the bad things are the good thing was that yes the dictator was overthrown finally the judiciary was restored but what unfortunate thing it uh, it left was that uh, here is there's a legacy that uh, you know it is just a failed attempt of the chief justice to make himself relevant i mean what is the job of the chief justice is it, it is it the job of the chief justice to have the malls opened is it the job of the chief justice to declare that when covid 19 is a pandemic and when it is not a pandemic i'm sorry to say this is not your job your job is to make sure that uh, you know justice is provided to the people i mean the courts in pakistan have been closed because of the uh, you know uh, because of the corona virus so people are already being affected their cases are not being heard this is your job your job is to provide cheap and speedy justice to the afflicted people in courts your job is not to suggest uh, that to opening reopen the malls so unfortunately this was rather irresponsible of the chief justice to insert himself in a debate which was which was not his basic concern you know this is the concern of politicians yes the judiciary is a very important part of the state but uh, i think a more relevant uh, good news uh, is that courts in pakistan would start opening from the 1st of june i think this is a better news than the chief justice deciding that covid 19 is not a pandemic and ordering uh, uh, you know uh, the opening of shopping malls because people want to buy you know some things for eat i mean this is not your job and this is a very unfortunate tendency and he is basically i mean you have read about it so i am feeling embarrassed now because this is making pakistan a laughing stock in the whole world you know in no country in the world does a chief justice ask for the markets to be open you know your job is to concentrate on your own job you know so this is a desperate attempt to just make yourself relevant in an already messy situation i'm not sure it is uh, i mean uh, um, you know i don't think uh, uh, you know uh, you know people in pakistan are a bit of a crazy lot i don't think many of them heard the chief justice because there is a middle class in this country which wants to go out and shop for it and this is basically because of the total failure of the government a to impose its writ b to really educate the public about a lockdown a public literacy campaign and what that entails you know uh, you know so i'm sorry this was a total uh, total uh, what should i say i mean um, uh, i don't want to comment any further on on this issue of the chief justice but it has made us very embarrassed in front of people like you i mean uh, i'm a pakistani also and uh, you know i would think twice before asking my fellow pakistanis uh, whichever office i might say that go out and shop till you drop you know in the midst of a, a disastrous uh, epidemic secondly uh, your second question yes i think i mentioned it uh, pakistan is a very vulnerable country it is a third world country uh, which has had a succession of uh, Uh, you know agreements with the imf and the world bank in fact it is it, it find itself in a rather unfortunate situation where it is it is borrowing more to pay existing debts pay previous debts so this is a sort of vicious circle you know uh, and i'm sure you know russia has also been through an imf program in the 1990s you know students of economics know that uh, you know shock therapy and wherever the imf has been it's been a disaster in countries like pakistan it is even more of a disaster because pakistan has an export oriented economy okay the only thing which we sell abroad is cloth you know cotton you know right now there are no orders in the world you know so uh, if pakistan uh, and pakistan has to sell cotton if it is to earn some foreign exchange because only when it be able to sell the cloth it will earn dollars and dollars are of course necessary to uh, keep uh, you know uh, your transactions with the rest of the world so unfortunately it is going to hit pakistan this coronavirus is going to hit pakistan 
very much because uh, and i don't know why the thoughtful prime minister of pakistan has uh, you know uh, has uh, you know given a 100 billion dollar package to the construction industry i wonder what that is going to do to pakistan i think uh, uh, you know um, they need to basically uh, tax the elite redistribution this is what redistribution means i mean the elite in pakistan have be have had it good for too long you know uh, and unfortunately even now as i mentioned in my talk uh, some of the equipment which was meant for the vulnerable has ended up in the hands of the elite the question is do you really need it no you don't need it you know because you can practice your social isolation like elite anywhere you can uh, you can uh, sit at home but you know so unless pakistan drastically changes its economic structure and of course i i also mentioned that uh, the budget is going to be presented in pakistan's national assembly in june so it is obviously going to be an emergency budget we don't know what is going to happen with covid 19 but uh, some things will have to be done yes pakistan has been fortunate to get aid from uh, european countries uh, you know especially targeting covid you know even imf has said that we are going to give you specific we aid meant for uh, covid victims you know but i am not sure whether this is a new sum of money given by the imf or is it money which is being taken out from existing programs which the imf has signed uh, with pakistan we will have to see pakistan is getting aid from saudi arabia it is getting aid from elma now i am not a supporter of aid at all i think i made it very clear in my talk i am totally again i think this is a time to practice austerity i think pakistan this is a time to practice self sufficiency you know this is a time for pakistan to reorder its priorities and you know you mentioned china i don't know uh, you know we haven't learned anything from china you know we pay lip service to friendship with china i mean um, i think uh, uh, right now uh, you know the least we can do is actually defend china you know because america the american the americans okay fine the american president is hell bent on uh, on uh, presenting china in a bad light you know you know he uh, i'm glad that uh, he uh, didn't agree to cut the who funding because of his animosity for china i think the least pakistan can do is to defend china you know if you are paying lip service to your friendship with china i think i mean but but uh, you know uh, there is a lot with uh, there is a lot uh, of secrecy with these cpec agreements you know uh, you know we don't know a lot about i mean i'm not sure if uh, in in the cpec agreement there is a specific clause which says that china is going to uh, you know help pakistan with any payments they're already providing us with a lot of money but i think the main issue the main thing is that we need to learn from china uh, as to how they overcame the corona virus this is basically i mean we haven't learned to their experts you know we have we did not even listen to what the chinese expert the free advice which they gave us uh, you know how to deal with we haven't bothered listening to them so i throw everything else else uh, out you know unfortunately okay thank you thank you very much and connected with the china uh, i give the floor to professor luzian because he is uh, he is a specialist in mongolian studies but he is an expert in russian uh, china chinese cooperation uh, that's okay. why i give the floor to professor luzian and you are welcome uh thank you thank you very much uh, mr naim thanks for your interesting consideration fruitful considerations in uh, pakistan virus experience pakistan dimensions and other things but uh my interest in china yeah and uh, um, i would like uh, ask uh one question but uh, you may short answer because it's a huge huge issue but uh, okay. uh how is china estimated in pakistan as a uh, real threat challenges and uh, uh, real help uh, and uh, positive factor for country development and uh, what do you think about chinese project one belt one road including uh, gwadar uh, port c and other and other uh, it's uh, uh, not virus history but it's very interesting <laughs> please thank you it's really <laughs> it, it's compared yeah it, it's a history it's 
Yes. You may uh, shout. You may shout to answer. Yes, I've prepared the same question about quadruple. <laughs> it's really interesting. Uh, can you repeat? I'm sorry, I could not hear you properly. I'm really sorry. Uh, please forgive well, me. Could you repeat, uh, uh, Professor Luzianin, uh, the question? Only the I'm, question. I'm very sorry for 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 the inconvenience. Sergey Gennadievich, could you repeat the question? Oh, uh, please, I repeat. Uh, uh, what do you think about Chinese policy in uh, Pakistan? Is a real threat as a real health factor? And uh, what do you think about One Belt, One Road? Uh, uh, what, is, uh, what is estimated in Pakistan? Uh, please, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, the second question is easier to answer. Uh, I think uh, much of that uh, is still up in the air. We don't know. It's like a dice, uh, which is in the air. We don't know what side the dice is going to land on, you know, about when one belt, one road initiative. Uh, most of what was promised, we have yet to see, you know. So we are also waiting like you are about the benefits of uh, OBOR uh, in, in Pakistan. Uh, the second, uh, the first question is a bit more complex because uh, obviously, uh, I mean, Pakistan is part of a very interesting neighborhood. You know, it is bordered on Iran by one side, it is bordered on India by the other side, one side bordered by Afghanistan, and th then there is China. Uh, out of all these countries, uh, China is the only country with which Pakistan has had a consistent. Uh, relationship you know even when pakistan had military dictatorship china supported uh, even mao even mao when china was ruled was uh, even mao and mao zedong the great revolutionary leader of china uh, who has got a great prestige in asia you know even when uh, when he was the president of china even he supported the ayub khan military regime you know although he was a communist and Ayub was a dictator, you know. So this should tell you that uh, China-Pakistan relationships are not ideological relationships. I mean, they are more nationalist interest, you know. And I think every country, I think you can say that about every country in the world. You know, every, I mean, uh, Von Clausewitz, the famous uh, uh, war uh, theoretician said that there are no friends or enemies. There are only interests, you know. So, uh, uh, so Pakistan's relationship with China has been very interesting and, uh, you know, uh, it has stood the test of time. But unfortunately, we haven't learned anything from China. We have, we pay lip service to China, that we do. You know, that China is our friend. We use a lot of hyperbole. We use a lot of metaphors, you know, that uh, till the end of eternity, Pakistan and China will be in friendship. Yes, we do a lot of that, you know. But uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, China got independent after Pakistan. You know, Pakistan uh, got a, uh, Pakistan became independent in 1947, and China became a People's Republic in 1949. But they are they still call themselves a developing country. But look where they are, and look where we are. You know, you know. So um, you know, uh, we have unfortunately not drawn the right lessons. Therefore, I'm also very skeptical whether we will even draw anything from CPEC or one belt, one road, because in 60, 60 plus years, I mean, no one is asking Pakistan to turn into a socialist country. Of course, it's a ridiculous notion right now. Even, even China is not a communist country anymore. I mean, it's ruled by a communist party. Uh, but, uh, but at least the least we could have done is to learn from this state system. Okay, if we have forgotten, learn how they are dealing with the coronavirus. But we are not even prepared to do that. So, you know, the friendship between India, China, Pakistan and China is a very interesting notion, but there is more to it than meets the eye. It's an interesting yes. idea. Yes. yes, it's a very interesting question, and uh, but we we don't have enough time to discuss, yes? Uh, and I want to ask the last question from from uh, organizer, as an organizer. I, I ha uh, we have a traditional question, uh, which uh, we ask uh, our expert about the globalization. What do you think about the future of globalization about, uh, in the period of post-pandemic? Uh, post? 
post pandemic after pandemia after pandemic well i think uh, globalization is basically a different name for the processes which started uh, which has been going on for more than 500 years i mean uh, you call it colonialism colonialism has ended you have imperialism now uh, you know uh, countries can't go and occupy physically but they have i mean the united states is the leading imperialist power in the world that is without a doubt it has got bases in more than 180 countries around the world i mean that is a fact i mean this is not some communist who is telling you this is actually a fact you know the united states still despite the nonsense response of donald trump to the corona virus the reality is that the united states is the world's in leading imperialist power but that is also changing now i think i mentioned that the arc of the future is wuhan you know the corona virus started in wuhan and it will end in wuhan even before that the workshop of the world is no longer the west it is the east the united states and the west is no longer the workshop of the world the manufacturing everything is now shifting to china and china is a rising global power fine they don't call themselves a global power but they are very modest about it unlike the united states who are not very modest about it you know uh, i mean iran is a rising power of the future in my opinion i am not saying it because china and iran are neighbors of pakistan you know no i'm saying it because this is the reality you know russia of course you know whatever you call it you know is also trying to break out uh, of this strangle hold of nato nato countries which have basically encircled russia you know put uh, mr putin has talked about it uh, very uh, you know often in his speeches how russia uh, you know it, it has created a lot of bad blood between the united states and america and america and russia so you know this is a world globalization is not going to come it come to an end but this is a world where populism is going to end this yeah. pandemic will mark the end of populism because populism everywhere you have populism jair bolsonaro in brazil look at what his response is to the pandemic look at what the president of the world's largest country democracy donald trump is saying about the pandemic look at what modi is saying about that. i mean india is also called the world's largest democracy look at what the modi regime's response to the pandemic thousands of people have been killed migrant workers on the roads you know killed by the pandemic you know imran khan in pakistan is also a very good example maybe a good looking example of a populist but a populist nevertheless you know um, you know so i think i am very sure that you know whenever we get out of the pandemic one thing which we are going to witness is the end of populism because it is populism the reason why these regimes are surviving is because of their empty promises not really treating the virus as it should be treated playing politics with everything promising and lying to their vote bank with one hand and doing completely the opposite to another so if if this virus is going to mark an end that it's going to mark the end of populism it's a very dangerous sort of politics but i hope that uh, you know uh, one thing which the which this uh, uh, pandemic is going to prove is the bankruptcy the emptiness of populism and there will be mobilization from young people there will be mobilization and there will be mobilizations for more popular participation in politics when people will begin young people you know especially when young people see through uh, this uh, disaster which is populism i know we we had bernie sanders who made had a very brave campaign in the united states but he was ejected from the democratic race you know he was ejected i, I don't think biden can defeat uh, Uh, defeat uh, trump because the conventional wisdom in the united states is biden is better than sand you know biden and trump is better than sanders you know this is what the democratic party is saying you know yeah. unfortunately you know it's very unfortunate that he has been defeated similarly jeremy corbyn in the united kingdom and now we know that there was a campaign in the labor party against corbyn in his own party there was a campaign and what a difference it would have made if corbyn was the prime minister and not this joker 
who's called Buddha Boris Johnson in, in the United Kingdom, you know. So globalization is going to carry on as usual, but I think the processes of exploitation will be challenged, you know. There is a challenge, where, you know, already there is a challenge, uh, you know, the whole system, the whole, I mean, capitalism has been, you know, I mean, this is not the first time capitalism has faced a crisis. Karl Marx predicted it 200 years ago. You know, he said there's going to be a periodic crisis, you know. So I think, you know, I think question marks have already started uh, over the system, over its viability, you know. And already people are asking questions. People are actually reading uh, Karl Marx once again, people are reading Karl Polanyi once again, you know, all these economists who had alternatives to the dominant neoliberal model, you know, so people are taking an interest in these things, young people will, I hope, see through these things, and they will ultimately build a movement, they will elect politicians who will be not, who will not be populist, but who will be more responsive to the needs of their populations, you know, and that is the hope, and of course, we are seeing that in every country, you know, and of course on an international level, there is a lot of resistance from countries like Iran, countries like China, countries like Venezuela. How long can you put them under sanctions? You know, just today there is an oil, a, a boat carrying Venezuelan oil from Venezuela to Iran. It reached Iran and, the, and they are angry about it. How dare uh, an oil tanker uh, come from Venezuela and provide oil to a country which we have put under sanctions, but they do it. You know, this is the kind of system we live in. So I don't want to be a pessimist, but I am hopeful that uh, A, we are going to come out of this pandemic and B, this uh, globalization will lead to new forms of the state, will lead to a challenge to the hegemony of the United States. There are new centers of power which are emerging in Africa, in Latin America, um, in, in Asia. And, uh, you know, of course, there is going to be a rise in, uh, in socialist uh, interest in socialism, you know, in, 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 in more popular grassroots kinds of mobilization, completely different from the old style of politics, which we know. Thank you very much. It's a very expressive and interesting point of view. And I think that all of us to, uh, are optimistic. So, dear colleagues, it's time to sum up. Uh, we have a lot of questions, and I think that it is a good reason to meet again with Dr. Naim, because it was wonderful, great, and very interesting for us to, uh, to knew the, uh, the uh, um, to knew the uh, another point of view from Pakistan. It's really interesting. The key aim of our seminar is uh, to get the information from the primary resources. And today we have these opportunities, uh, thanks to Dr. Naim. I'd like to express my gratitude to all of you for accepting our invitation and for your overwhelming speech and comprehensive answers to our question. Dear colleagues, as always, I wish you all the best. Take care and see you soon at our next meetings. Thank you very much, dear Thank Dr. You. Naim. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.